Episode 341. All publicity is good publicity. The crowd was rushing out. Like a sandbag, the figure flew out of the ring and hit the ground hard, creating a plume of dust. Blah! Seven spit out sand and stood up with his hand rubbing his back. He turned his head and looked at Dovlar. He was just about to open his mouth, but he heard the cold voice of Bates from his side. Enough. You lost. Seven shivered, looked at his feet in horror, and found his way out of the circle. It wasn't fair. The arena was too small. I wouldn't have lost if it weren't for that. Seven was quite displeased, and at the same time, he was confused. He did not know that Doblar knew his greatest weaknesses and had targeted his back specifically for that reason. Bates shook his head, not saying anything, but walking step by step toward Doblar in the middle of the arena. Behind him, Brick's face was twisted in a horrible scowl. His father didn't know that he was there, and he was hiding this incident from the rest of his family. He thought that he could have made them proud when he returned, having unexpectedly vanquished a great enemy. But Brick did not expect that his own people would have been defeated three times in a row before Aiden had even touched the ring. If word of this got out, how could he face his family again? And if Jenna found out, how would he possibly be able to impress her and win her back now? Thinking of Jenna, Brick thought of her relationship with Aiden and immediately got even angrier. Brick looks at Bates' back, realizing with fear that Aiden and Bates were at about the same skill level. If this was truly the case, Brick would go insane. How could it be that a 16-year-old was a worthy opponent for one of the most skilled fighters in the entire country? However, his strong sense of intuition forced Brick to believe that this had to be true. Seven angrily rolled up his sleeves and returned to the rest of his team, standing with 13 and 19. All three had been easily defeated by the same nobody. At this moment, shame surrounded them. They distracted themselves from it by focusing on Bates' face. Doblar, meanwhile, nodded to Bates and emerged from the ring. His goal had been achieved. There was no need to continue. The stage now belonged to Aiden and Bates. The crowd gave Doblar generous applause. Doblar's skilled hands made everyone open their eyes to the intensity of the fight they were witnessing. Meanwhile, every major Arkland City news network was broadcasting videos of the fight. Footage of Doblar defeating 19, 13, and 7 was plastered all over every single major channel. The network executives were boiling. Is this some kind of movie stunt? I have no idea what's going on here. Could it possibly be real? But whether people believed it or not, the Midnight Snack Corner was famous once again. There were already many more people gathering outside the Midnight Snack Corner door either to watch the fight or eat in the restaurant that was hosting such unusual live entertainment. All publicity is good publicity. Advertising ability, plus one. Back on the beach, Aiden patted Doblar's shoulder, letting him finally rest. He stepped into the area in his stead, staring Bates down. Miller was ardently looking after the exhausted Doblar, his eyes full of worship. After all, he saw how he had learned all of these techniques only in the past couple of days. Doblar was certainly an innately gifted fighter. If Doblar had begun to practice his combat skills earlier in life, he would undoubtedly have become a master at them long ago. Bates and Aiden finally faced one another in the middle of the challenge arena. Bates' expression at this time was just as haughty and indifferent as when he first came. However, in reality, Doblar's amazing performance had left him rather surprised. And knowing that Doblar answered to Aiden, he guessed that his strength would at the very least, be somewhat equal. He was engrossed, watching Aiden circle him with an unreadable expression. Bates' very first move in a fight was always to stare his competitor down, like a lion looking at his prey. In the past, some of his opponents had surrendered on the spot because they couldn't stand the intensity of his gaze. Aiden, however, felt Bates' provocation, and a smile spread across his face from the corner of his lips. Turning his self-confidence into real momentum, an insane burst of energy suddenly flew out of Aiden, like he was swallowing the sky and swallowing the ground and hurtling the power of all of it directly towards Bates. Bates' pupils shrank, and he felt a jump in his heart as a very real fear for his life overcame him. His feet moved and he just wanted to back away, but suddenly his head chimed in. No way! If you give him even an inch now, you lose! Bates bit down hard on his tongue, prepared to absorb his terror, but the wind had already frightened out of him. There was a salty taste in his mouth as fresh blood oozed from his tongue. Bates' face turned cold. 
he was already hurt, and the competition hadn't even started. The crowd watched with anticipation and excitement. They didn't realize just how dangerous this fight would be. To them, it was just another show. They also didn't know that the battle had essentially already begun. They only saw Aiden and Bates standing in the middle of the field, staring each other down. Are they going to fight or not? Well, this isn't as good as it was just now. While the fight was commencing, two people were standing silently in the shade of a tree on the opposite road, watching the activities in front of the midnight snack corner shop from afar. The first of the two was an old man with thin white hair and childlike complexion. He was wearing a simple, long white coat. He stood there with the demeanor of a wise old professor. Behind him, a handsome middle-aged man in a similar black coat was huddling under an overcoat. He was concerned about the old man and said, Father, it's cold. Shouldn't you wear a thicker jacket? The old man shook his head decisively and refused. Nelson, you're only cold because you have no heart to keep you warm. The middle-aged man in the black coat was Nelson, the eldest son of the Shue family. And the identity of the old man, consequently, was Jonathan Shue, patriarch of another of the great three Arkland City families. Since the last time Jenna brought back coffee and cakes as a present for him, Jonathan had been studying the items day in and day out. He had ordered many more of them from the midnight snack corner to verify that those were just as good as the first ones. He combed through the old recipe and technique books written by his ancestors, but couldn't find a single thing that compared in any way to these unique creations. He even invited friends from professional cooking circles to examine them, but even they were confused at how these things were made. Discouraged, Jonathan finally resolved himself to meet Aiden, the magical young man who invented those two things. But he did not expect that he would arrive at the seaside and witness a scene where the entirety of the Mortar family had come to challenge Aiden. For a while, Jonathan stopped to observe both sides with great interest. Hearing his father's criticism, Nelson immediately rolled his eyes and pursed his lips. As if he could feel Nelson's expression behind him, Jonathan shook his head and sighed. Nelson, let's test your eyesight. Which side do you think will win this fight? 